I'm an avid um, sports fan, particularly the Houston sports team. Do you know during the previous month, there was great excitement for the Houston Astros, who took first place in the Central Division. They won 95 games this season. They led all of Major League Baseball in hitting. It was just great hope that they'll win the World Series. Where they took care of the first two opponents, and they won convincingly in the playoff. They were the American League champions as they went on to play against the Atlantic Braves, who were the National League champion. Our home team was favored to win the best of seven games in the World Series. However, the series didn't go that well for us. We're behind three games to one. And they're in the fifth game at Atlanta. Things um, turn kind of more sour, particularly during that first inning to, where Freeman to hit a grand slam and we're already behind 4-0 in the first inning. And most of the Astro fans just lost hope. And this reminds me what happened from the reading of our passage this morning in Luke chapter 24. We saw the disciple lost hope of Christ being the Messiah after Jesus was crucified. Now, although Christ rose, although Christ was crucified, he rose from the dead. And here in this last chapter of Luke, Luke chapter 24, there were two appearances of witnesses to the risen Christ. From Luke chapter 24, verses 1 to 12, a group of women went to the grave where they found an empty tomb. And the angel announced that Jesus was alive. He told the disciple, Really, the disciples um, ignore their report. And although Christ has foretold to them of his death and resurrection, his own disciples truly believe. Then Luke, in the next paragraph, which is our passage this morning, records a second appearance of witnesses to the risen Christ. It's here in Luke, Luke being the only gospel who wrote about the detailed uh, encounter that Jesus had with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. I believe Luke highlights this incident because it resembles the reaction from the disciple of Christ. Although they were with Christ, they thought they knew who Jesus is. But in reality, they did not know him personally. Their view of the coming Messiah was distorted. And this morning, I divided our passage into three sections. If you have a bulletin, you can pull out the outline, sermon outline. The first point is that their eyes were open, or I'm sorry, the eyes were closed. They were kept from recognizing Jesus. And secondly, the scripture were opened and fulfilled. And lastly, and their eyes were open, and they recognized Jesus. So, let's first 
Let me just give you just a little background. If you remember even from last week, people were coming to Jerusalem from far and near to celebrate the Passover. They all saw personally or heard about Christ entering into Jerusalem that week, riding on a donkey, fulfilling the prophecy of Ezekiel of the coming Messiah. Sorry, it's Zechariah. Prophecy as Zechariah of the coming Messiah. And their hopes are really high. But Jesus was crucified on the cross that week. Just like the Houston Astros, fans' hope of winning the World Series was shattered. Similarly, we see the Jewish people hope of the coming Messiah to save them from the bondage of the Roman government was also shattered when Jesus was crucified. Here in verse 13, we're introduced to two of the followers of Christ who left Jerusalem with this, their shattered hope as they headed to a village named Emmaus. My son uh, informed me that uh, he bought a World Series tickets to game six. He had great hope. The Astros are coming back and we're going to win the World Series. Unfortunately, the Astros lost. He felt dejected. He talks with other Astros fans as they left the stadium commiserating with each other of their painful loss. And we see in verse 15 of the passage, it says that while they were walking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. This word disgusting means an exchange of ideas. The two disciples were reminiscing and, and just thinking back uh, all the things that took place that week and trying to make sense of what was happening, particularly with the death of Christ. And we saw in verse 17 that they were sad and disappointed what they witnessed. They had lost hope in Christ as the Messiah that will save them from their suffering. They were so immersed in their, in their sorrow that they missed out on the significance of this historic event. Various times God allows our dreams to die before he brings it back alive. When our hopes and dreams are shattered, we cannot see God clearly. We might have been involved in a relationship with a young lady and it just didn't work out. Or we might have received a rejection letter from that school that we've been dreaming of attending. Or we were just saddened, not getting that promotion that we were dreaming of. In various times, we tend to forget that God is sovereign, that he is good. Well, these two disciples were discouraged. They were sad. They were confused. And as they were engaged in this deep conversation with each other, Jesus joined them. What was really interesting, as recorded in verse 16, is that it says, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him or Jesus. It was not that they 
did not recognize Jesus, but, but God kept them from recognizing Jesus. And we will understand this more clearly as the story unfolds. And may we remember that God always writes the last chapter. What appears to be fuzzy now will be made clearer later. May we learn to trust our Lord even when things appear to be not going very well. Let's listen in to this conversation that Jesus had with them. Jesus approached them with a simple question that bewildered the disciples. It was here in verse 17. It says, and he, Jesus speaking, said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. One of the disciples named Clebus answered Jesus by saying, are you the only one, the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened See, there in these days? The Cleopas assume that everyone in Jerusalem knew what was happening. It was like somebody coming to Houston last month in the midst of the World Series here in Houston and not having any idea that the World Series was going on. Well, the conversation continued with Jesus asking, what, what, what is this, these things that you're talking about? Cleopas went on to explain as we look at verses 19 to 21. And he said to them, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty indeed, and were before God and all people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to the condemned to death and crucify him. But we have hope that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. So Cleopas described that Jesus of Nazareth was the central figure of their conversation. Jesus was acknowledged as a prophet who performed miracles and taught with authority. He probably might have heard about Jesus' teaching. And he might have seen some of the miracles that, that Jesus performed. However, Cleopas thought Jesus was more than a prophet. He is well as many Jews was hoping that Jesus is the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament, who will come to redeem Israel. This word redeemed uh, involves liberating someone by paying a ransom or a price. Now, this should be clear since the Jews just celebrated the Passover where a sacrifice of a lamb was made to redeem the firstborn. They understood that redemption requires a payment for someone to pay a price. They never thought that Jesus, who they thought would be the Messiah, would be executed. They were puzzled. They were confused. You see, most Jews believe that the Old Testament prophecies points to a military and political Messiah who will free them from the, the Roman tyranny. But as far as they, they knew, 
Jesus died like all the other prophets before him. The dream of being safe physically from the Roman government was shattered. The disciples were baffled at what was happening. They blamed the religious leaders for the death of Christ. And Cleopas goes on to explain more about what was going on as we read from verses 22 to 24. And he says, Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find the, his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. But him they did not see. We best tells Jesus that he heard some woman going to the tomb early in the morning and did not find the body of Christ there. But instead found an angel telling telling them that Jesus is alive, that he's risen. When the ladies uh, quickly to, went back to the disciples to let them know of what they have seen at the tomb, some of the disciples went out to check it out. And they verified that indeed the, what the woman said was true. They could not find the body. Now, although the two followers have heard this amazing report from the woman, whom some of the disciples verified that Jesus has risen, yet they were sad, disappointed, feeling, feeling to, uh, hopeless. They admit it. Their amazement at what the woman said, that Jesus was alive. However, they did not go looking for Jesus, like Peter. And they did not stay for the risen Jesus to come to them. Instead, they left Jerusalem, which is a sign to me that they really did not believe the story from the woman. They just gave up hope of this Messiah. Somehow they conclude that Jesus did not rise from the dead, although there were clear evidence. But they did not believe. In their mind, they only saw a dead Messiah. See, their eyes were closed and they were kept from recognizing Jesus. As we look at the second portion of this passage, we see the scriptures were opened and fulfilled. So after Cleopas shared what is in his heart, Jesus rebuked the two followers. Then he opens the Bible to explain clearly what the prophets, what the prophecies had to say about the Messiah's death and resurrection and how Jesus fulfilled these prophecies. Let's take a look in verses 25 and 27. And he said to them, Oh, foolish one, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And these things concerning himself? After hearing all that Cleopas 
say about what happened to Jesus, Jesus himself had heard enough and had to respond. Jesus rebuked them, saying that they were foolish, that they were slow in heart to believe. That the, the evidence stood before them, and yet they did not believe. The prophets have written a lot about the coming Messiah. They have possession of the scripture, but they were not familiar with the scripture. I got together with some old friends a few months ago who had been Christians for some 35 years. I mentioned to them about the Bible in 90 days where one could read through the whole Bible in 90 days if they read 12 pages a day. As we were talking, they admitted, most of them admitted that they had never read through the Bible from cover to cover, although they had been a Christian for decades. So I challenged them to, to set aside 90 days to read through the Bible so that they would get to know God more thoroughly. Just a few weeks ago, they informed me that they have completed reading the whole Bible from cover to cover. And after they were done, they were, they were hungry to, to learn more from the Scripture. Too often, we only are familiar with uh, those familiar passages in the Bible. But yet, if we open up a Bible, there are many sticky pages, maybe in the prophets, that we may never opened up or have read from. We claim that uh, we know Jesus, but in reality, we only know about Jesus. See, God has given us the scripture so that we can know God, that we can have an intimate relationship with him. And may we read it and seek to understand it. Well, Jesus did not just scold these two disciples and left them alone, but he took time to open up the scripture and to explain to them systematically from the prophets what they taught about the coming Messiah. You see, from the Old Testament, there contain over 300 prophecies about the coming Messiah. And all of these prophecies were fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Let, let me just uh, list some of these prophecies to you. Jesus, or this Messiah, is to be born in the tribe of Judah. That's Genesis 49.10. He will come through the family line of Jesse. We see this in Isaiah 11.1. 1. He will be a descendant of King David. Recorded in Jeremiah 23, 5. And the Messiah will be born in the city of Bethlehem. Micah 5, 2. He will receive gifts from kings. Psalm 72, 10. He shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 7, 14. He will be betrayed by a friend. Psalm 41, 9. The Messiah will be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Zechariah 11, 13. His hands and feet pierced, which is a sign of crucifixion. Psalm 22, 16. The Messiah will die with thieves. Isaiah 53, 12. And none of his bone will be broken. 
Psalms 34, 20. The Messiah will have his sides pierced. Zechariah 12, 10. He will be resurrected. Psalm 16, 10. He will be buried with a rich man in a rich man tomb. Isaiah 53, 9. These are just some of the prophecies. There are over 300 of them. And we might be able to find a person that could fulfill one or two of these prophecies. For a person to fulfill all 300 plus, that is impossible unless it comes from God. Peter Stoner wrote in Science Speaks. He said that the chances that any man will fulfill eight of the prophecies, it would be one over 10 to the 17th power. That is one with 17 zeros. And to kind of illustrate this, he says, well, this number is so big, um, let me kind of describe this in a concrete way. If you take, if you take silver dollar, if you have 10 to the 17th power of these silver dollars, you could lay these silver dollar on the floor of the whole state of Texas. And that's not going to do it. You have to stack it up two feet in order to make it into the 17th power. Now, if you were to mark one of this silver corn, mark it an X, and blindfold someone, and, and, and this person would just randomly pick, pick the right corn that would be marked on it. It's 1 to the 10 to, 10 to the 17th power. Now, that's only for eight prophecy. Can you imagine 300, over 300 prophecies? And that was described in the Old Testament. Now, of all these prophecies, Jesus focuses on one of them. We see recorded in verse 26. It says, was it not necessary that Christ to suffer these things and enter into his glory. Scripture points to this Messiah's suffering before entering his glory. This prophecy is fulfilled in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 to 6. Let me just read that to you. It says, Surely he has bore our grief and carried our sorrow. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquity. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. We see here, clearly, Scripture makes it this that the Messiah needs to suffer, that he pays the penalty on our behalf to be the ransom for our sin. And we see this also stated by Jesus in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. It says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom many. However, the, these two disciples heading to Emmaus had it all backward. They wanted the Messiah to establish the glory of the Davidic kingdom on earth before he dies. But from Isaiah 53, Jesus makes it clear that the Messiah must must suffer first. He died to pay the penalty of sin, to set us free from the bondage of sin. Then he will enter into his glory. 
See, all of Scripture really points to Jesus as the coming Messiah. Any Jew that knew the Scripture well would have their eyes open to Jesus. You know, my uh, neighbor uh, brought me to church when I was 10. I thoroughly enjoyed learning about Jesus from the Bible. I figured that I was saved because I was a fairly obedient child and I, I attended church regularly and I could tell others about Jesus. However, it wasn't until I was 15 that I fully understood the gospel. I thought I knew who Jesus was, that I was saved because of my good works. But it wasn't until Sherman, who opened up scripture to me and explained to me that I was a sinner, that the wages of sin is death, that I'm separated from God because of my sin. Neither that I, either that I have to pay that penalty or someone pay that penalty on my behalf. And Jesus came to suffer and died as a ransom for my sin. And then if I were to place my faith upon the work of Christ on the cross, where he died and rose again, then I will be saved. For Jesus suffered so that I do not need to suffer. We see the two people that headed to Emmaus thought that they knew who the Messiah was. Their hope was shattered when they saw Jesus being crucified. They did not truly believe in the Messiah. Just like I thought I was saved, these two followers of Jesus thought they were saved also. It wasn't until Jesus explained to them who he is that we see that their eyes initially were closed. However, as the scripture was open to them, their eyes were open and they recognized Jesus. The two disciples have arrived home and they wanted to spend more time with Jesus. Therefore, they invited him in for a meal. Let us read on, beginning in verse 28 to 32. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. They acted as he was going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So we went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? while he opened to us the scripture. Jesus not only had dinner with them, he took the initiative to act as a host by taking the bread, blessing it, broke it, gave it to them, just as he's done during the Last Supper as we studied that last week. All of a sudden, the eyes were open, their eyes were open, and they recognized Jesus. 
the two followers started sharing with each other about what they thought and what they were feeling. Once they were sad, discouraged, disappointed, where their hopes were shattered, they were blind, and now they see. Because they were so immersed in their sorrow, it prevented them from seeing who Jesus is. And because of their lack of knowledge from Scripture, they have an incomplete understanding about the coming Messiah. After the Lord opened the Scripture to teach them about the coming Messiah, their eyes were opened and their hope were rekindled. They knew something special was happening as they heard Jesus teach from Scripture. But they didn't, did not know him until Jesus broke bread with them. It says in verse 31, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. So we see the, this word, were open, was, is in the passive voice. They did not open their own eyes, but rather God was the one that opened their eyes. The moment that they opened their eyes, that God opened their eyes, they recognized Jesus. Note that God is the one that is in control of all things. God, who had kept them from recognizing who Jesus was back in verse 16, now opens their eyes to the teaching of the word and the breaking of bread. Now, there might be some of us here who might have heard about Christ, but not fully understand who he is and what he has done, that he has, he has suffered and died on the cross to pay the penalty of our sins. Not only did he die, but three days later he rose again, showing that God has accepted what Jesus has done on our behalf. And if anyone would place their faith in Jesus Christ, he or she will be saved. And I want to extend an invitation to you, if you have not placed your trust in Christ, that you would do that today, because Jesus is the Messiah. We see that the disciples' hearts have changed. They describe their hearts as burning from within. The emotions responded after the truth was explained to them. When their hearts were changed, it affected their behavior. They believed that Jesus is the Messiah as prophesied in Scripture. They immediately wanted to go back to Jerusalem to find the 11 disciples to tell them what they have experienced seeing the risen Lord. They did not waste any time. They rushed back. They were so excited that they had to tell someone, particularly those that were closest to them. We, we read this in verses 33 to 35. It says, and they rose that same that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen in thee and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what has happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now, after these two followers of Christ understood the gospel, Thoroughly, 
They immediately want to tell others. And for those of us here that have received the salvation from Christ, may we be excited about this good news and may we be willing to tell others about what he has done for us, just as the two disciples from Emmaus. Well, one of the ways that we can do so to, is to invite our friends and family to come to the holiday musical this coming weekend. This performance will be presented three different times on Friday night, Saturday afternoon, and Saturday evening. And it's called Born to be Free. The gospel is going to be clearly presented through music and drama. Please, come and invite a seeker to come with you. And because of the Emmaus disciples' incomplete understanding about the coming Messiah, their hope was shattered when they saw Jesus being crucified. However, their hope was rekindled when Jesus used scripture to show them that the coming Messiah must suffer before being glorified. Christ is our hope in life and death. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, um, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for loving us so much that you came to die on the cross on our behalf, to pay the penalty of sin. Not only did you die, but you rose again, Lord. Indeed, you must suffer before you are glorified. And Father, may we not only receive the gospel, but may we be eager to tell others about it. In Jesus' name.